first thing that we're going to do is we'll talk about heart rate. Heart rate, super simple. There's two different ways that you can do heart rate. One is for 30 seconds. And then you would multiply the beats per minute by two. And it's going to be measured in beats per minute. Or you could do it for 60 seconds. And then you just count the number of beats that you get in that minute, beats per minute. And that's your value. Now, I know this sounds crazy, but sometimes people don't know how to use one of these things. It says something like this here with a six and a three and a nine over here. There's one and two and a four and a five. This is called a clock. Sometimes people don't know how to use these kind of clocks anymore. And one time I sat there while somebody did a 30 second heart rate and they let the clock go all the way around three times, one, two and three. And I was like, whoa, when are we going to end? She said after 30 seconds. And she thought that one whole time around was 10 seconds. No, that's not how it works. If you don't know how to use a regular clock, just use an analog or, a, I mean, a digital clock and that'll work best. But for heart rate, you're going to go 30 seconds, count the number of beats per minute and multiply by two. Now, remember, because you're multiplying by two, this is always going to give you an even number. And that's not necessarily going to be accurate because sometimes people's heart beats 73 times per minute, not 74. So if you're doing 30 seconds and multiplying by two, it could be the case that you're off by a, a beat or two, but I don't think that's really that important. Why, why would you do a 60 second versus a 30 second and vice versa. Like what's the point of doing a 30 second heart rate palpitation and multiply by two? Alice, I'm calling you out. Why would you do 30 seconds and multiply by two and not a full 60 second analysis? What do you think? I would assume it's to save time. Absolutely, right? So you can get pretty much the same result in half the time. So if I have 200 people and I do 60 seconds, it's gonna take me 200 minutes at least. But 200 minutes is much longer than 100 minutes. Now, if you're gonna work at Workout World and your goal is to get a job, then what I would do is I would say, well, what we could do, ma'am, who's hiring me, what we could do, ma'am, is we could do a 30 second heart rate palpitation or we could do a 60 second heart rate palpitation, which would you like me to do? And then what you're doing is you're demonstrating your understanding of the procedure. And I think that that person who's hiring you would say, oh, well, great job for giving me that information. Why don't you do a 30 second heart rate and save us a little bit of time. So you could do heart rate for 30 seconds and you're counting the number of beats that you actually feel with your finger. But sometimes it's gonna be a little bit faint. So it's not always as easy as you think. So I'm gonna draw a hand. Please excuse my lack of ability to draw stuff. And this is my finger. This is another finger. This is another finger. And this is a pinky finger. So this is my thumb here. All right, so this is your thumb. You're looking at your palm. So this is your, your palm. This is your, um, all of those little wrinkles in your palm, looking at the palm up. And I'll just remind you, palm up, palm up. And this is anatomical position. Whoopsies, undo, palm up, and anatomical position, all right, palm up. 
So you're looking at your left hand right now. You can put your left hand out so you can see it. And then this is the bottom of your hand, the wrist, kind of like this here. And underneath the bottom of your hand, you're gonna have these two ligaments. Actually, they're not ligaments, they're tendons. And you're gonna feel them. There's one that goes right here, all the way down, and another one that's right next to it. You can feel it, especially if you like flex your wrist, you'll be able to feel these. These are your, those tendons that go right down the middle of your wrist. Now, the way that you palpate heart rate is you, palpate the radial side and we'll have to explain what the radial side of your arm is the radial side of the arm with your index finger and your middle finger don't use your thumb to collect heart rate because your thumb has a pulse of its own so it could confuse you if you use your thumb because your thumb has a pulse and it could compromise or make the validity of your assessment wrong. So you're gonna use your radial, the, the artery that's right here. I, mean, I, shouldn't, I should make it red, but I won't. There's, there's an artery that goes right here And it's on the radial side of your arm. How do you remember radial? Well, there's two different sides. There's the radial side and the ulna side, U-L-N-A. There's the radius and the ulna. And the way that I remember it is that ulna has one, two, and three, and four letters to it. But the radial side has one, two, three, four, five, and six. So radial is bigger than ulna, and the thumb is bigger than the pinky. So the radial side has got to be the thumb side, and the ulna side has got to be the pinky side. So that's how I remember it. So the radial side is right here, and what you're going to do is you're going to take your fingers you're gonna take your index finger here of the other hand, obviously, and the middle finger of your other hand. And what you're gonna do is, am I recording this? Yes. And you're gonna put your index finger here. Actually, just kidding. This is your middle finger here. And you're gonna put your index finger right here. And you might have to shift your fingers up and down a little bit. But if you put your index finger and your middle finger on the radial side and you palpate this, your radial artery here, you should be able to feel your heart rate. So I want you to practice that for a couple of seconds. All right, I want you to try to palpate your radial artery. And if you have a roommate, like you're in the penitentiary, like the ladies, see if you can like get your radial palpation on somebody else. Or I actually want you to try to do that right now with your own hand if you can, all right? And when you're able to collect a heart rate, maybe what you can do is just give me a thumbs up if you're able to do it. This is something that I think that people are able to do. All right. Seems as though there's some success rate here. Feel free to be able to uh, palpate your roommate or your parent or somebody else's heart rate, but that's how you do heart rate. Pretty straightforward. Come on, Mike, if you have any issues. For the ladies who are doing lacrosse and for the individuals who are highly trained athletes, 
your heart rate's going to be pretty low. Your blood pressure is going to be relatively low as well. And therefore, it might even be difficult to actually palpate your radial pulse. But usually people are alive and people who are alive have pulses. So it should be pretty reasonable. Again, you would do it for 30 seconds, multiply the number of beats that you palpate per minute by two. And you would indicate that as like maybe 63, or actually if you do it 30 by two, it won't be, it won't be an uneven number. It will be like 64 beats per minute or something or other. And then when you put this into your graph, when you do your lab write-up, you would just indicate beats per minute. And then what you want to do is three different measurements and then multiply that, um, sorry, three different measurements and take the average. Does anybody have any questions about how to collect heart rate? Now, if you go to the lab section and you take a look at the labs and you take a look at the heart rate information, this is how it will tell you to collect your heart rate data. That's pretty much as easy as I can get. Now, before you do heart rate, you wanna have your subject resting for five minutes. You want to have them sitting quietly. And heart rate is based on blood flow. So you do not want to have them sitting with their legs crossed. You want to have them just sitting peacefully. Sometimes what I do is I'll use the The um, PARMED X, the, um, the lifestyle evaluation, the medical history, I'll give them that before they do heart rate. And because they're filling out the PARQ and they're filling out the lifestyle evaluation, they're sitting for about five minutes filling all that stuff out. And that will serve to get their heart rate to a resting heart rate. And then you don't, you want to make sure that they're not crossing their legs and such. And there's other things that I would show you as well, but I, I don't have time to do it today. What I want to do here is when you're sitting, you want to establish a working relationship with the individual. So for instance, what I would do is I would put a chair here And I would sit in this chair, all right, legs, while, and I'm facing this direction, while my subject is sitting here, and they're facing in this direction, sitting in the chair. They're facing this direction. Now, what that does is it makes it so that this arm on this side can palpate this arm of the subject. But if I put the chairs kind of like this in front of each other, then my legs are in the middle of my subject's legs and it's kind of awkward. So I establish a working environment here so that I'm side by side and this person can move this chair up as far as they need without crashing into that person. So it's just a little bit of a subtle change in the way the environment is set up. But what I do it, what I do is I establish good visual communication with my subject. I make it so that I can control my subject's arm, but I'm not in their direct space. So I'm kind of like not legs in legs and arms in arms. I'm giving them their own space and me my own space. But for right now, all I want you to do is just think about this procedure here. All right. Does anybody have any questions on heart rate? Anybody have any difficulty finding heart rate?
All right, I'm assuming that we're good to go in regards to heart rate. So I'm gonna clear this. And then we're gonna start talking about blood pressure. And there are two blood pressures that we're looking at. We're looking at systolic and we're looking at diastolic. Systolic and diastolic. So we have to kind of remember what each of these phases of the heart contraction is. So we'll go over this real quick. Systolic is when the heart is contracting. So the heart is beating and the, the heart muscle is contracting inwards and it's creating a force or a pressure within the heart that's gonna take the blood and it's gonna make the blood want to leave the left ventricle and go into the body. Like it's a sponge. If you squeeze the sponge, then the liquid in the sponge leaves. Diastolic is the opposite. A diastolic blood pressure is when the heart is relaxing. And when the heart is relaxing, the heart is kind of like actually sort of like, I guess, moving in this direction. And what it's doing is it's creating a very low pressure. And because the pressure is low, what's gonna happen is it's going to suck blood into the right vena cava or from the right vena cava into the right, this is more appropriate, I guess, atria. And that's gonna cycle the blood through the heart. So systolic is when the heart is contracting and squeezing blood out of it. And diastolic is when the heart is relaxing. So I just wanna get, get that out there. So the easiest way for me to explain blood pressure is when you, when you actually collect blood pressure and you have your, there's a couple of things you're gonna need. You're gonna need this cuff, a blood pressure cuff with the Velcro on one side. Don't, don't, don't. Dunk, 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 dunk. And the Velcro on the other side over here, this is gonna be like the harsh part of the Velcro. And then you're gonna have this little arrow here that says, line this up with your brachial artery. That's gonna be attached to a long tube and that's gonna have like a little bell on it. And the bell here is gonna have a little dial. And you're gonna squeeze this little rubber gasket here, squeeze it, and that's going to force air through the tube into this cuff. It's called a blood pressure cuff. You're also going to have a stethoscope, which is your earpiece and another earpiece, and you're going to have this long tube. I'm sure everybody's seen these things. It's attached to your earpiece, uh, sorry, which is attached to a drum or your bell. So if you look at that piece right here, oftentimes it'll look like this, it like it has one side to it and then it has this part here and then it has another side to it, which is flat. It has another like tube right here that you can switch. So you can, and then over here, it has the long tube here and then you have your ear pieces, ear pieces like this. And you take these things and you put them in your ears. And then you listen by putting either the, the diaphragm. This is called the bell. The small one is the bell and the big one is the diaphragm. For the most part, you're gonna use that side. If you wanna listen to like gurgling sounds, really deep sounds in the stomach, you're gonna use this side. And if you look, man, I'm just trying to draw this stuff on the computer, it's a little bit difficult. If you look here, it'll have these two different sides to the stethoscope. And then right in the middle, it, you'll be able to kind of like, all right, so then I'm gonna erase this. Let's see, here. try to draw it a little bit better. Um, what's the easiest way to do it? How do I do this? So you have, like, you'll be able to switch this back and forth right here. Right here, there'll be like a junction. This is the tube, oh, dang it. This is the tube you listen through. And then right here, there'll be like a little bit of a pivot 
there's like a little bit of a an opportunity to switch the bell this way or switch the bell that way. I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about. It's hard to draw and hard to explain. But for the most part, you want to use the diaphragm of the stethoscope, not the small part. Now, when you, when you use the stethoscope, you're going to take these earpieces here and you're going to put them in your ears. And the way that these things are going to be is they're going to point inward, like that, inward. And then you have the tube that you listen through. This is pointing away from the screen, pointing away from the screen. And your ears are the same way. Your ear canal is, is directed forward. So when you put these ear pieces in, they could be facing away from you or they could be facing towards you. And the way that you wanna put them in is when you hold onto the stethoscope, if you look at my screen, my fingers are pointing towards the screen. It's hard to write, it's hard to draw dimension on a two dimensional screen, but you're gonna take the ear pieces and they're gonna face forward and you put them in your ears facing forward because your ear canals are facing forward. So sound can come in this way. If you put it opposite and the ear pieces are facing backwards, then you won't hear anything. So you take the stethoscope, you take the ear pieces and make sure that they're facing the way that your trigger fingers would face. And you put the ear pieces in facing forward. All right, let me erase a little bit of this stuff to make it easier to understand. So this is the pieces. We have the stethoscope and the sphygmomanometer. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna take, let's go like this, this is your arm, this is your hand, and this is your bicep. Let me think about the best way to explain this to you. All right, let me just try to draw it differently. So I have my hand here, my thumb, and I have my finger, 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 pinky finger. All right, we're gonna be working on this side of the arm. It's, this is thumb, thumb side. And your arm is facing anatomically, so your hand is, I'm looking at your right hand right now. These are your creases in your palm. This is the bottom of your wrist. We're gonna be working on this side. And if I, if I extend my arm like that, this is my forearm. Just look down in your arm. This is the crux of your elbow here. And now this is going to be where your bicep is. I'm just looking down my arm. My hand is here. So, whoops. This is my thumb, finger, 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 and pinky finger here. I'm looking down my arm. Same thing as this. It's just further down this way. And you take a look at your bicep right here. A lot of times people will put the stethoscope right in the crux of their elbow, right in the crux right in the joint of the elbow, right in the middle. But the problem with that is that there's a number of different blood vessels that go through here. So if you put the stethoscope directly in the middle of your elbow joint right here, it actually doesn't give such a very clear um, beat or sound. What I usually do is maybe you can just look at the screen. Maybe this is easiest. You're trying to palpate the brachial artery. And if I put my arm up like that, I actually put the stethoscope right there, right underneath the biceps. So here's my bicep muscle here. Instead of putting the stethoscope right in the middle of the joint, right there, there's a lot of crosstalk. Put the stethoscope right underneath the belly of the muscle right there. And that's how you're gonna get the brachial artery. So you put the sound, the, the, the diaphragm of the stethoscope right there, right underneath the bicep. You're also gonna have to line your 
sphygmomanometer so that the line of the sphygmomanometer also is lined up right here, right underneath the belly of the muscle. So maybe I can show you like here, if this is my, man, it's so hard to draw. I'm not a great artist actually. You have your arm here, let's take a look. You have your other, your upper arm, this is your hand, like this. And then you have your bicep is gonna come here, right there. I take the stethoscope and I put it right here, right at the bottom of my bicep as opposed to right in the crux of my elbow. Sometimes you'll see people put it here. I don't think that this is helpful for me, right there, right in the middle. Actually, if this is my bicep muscle here, I'll take the stethoscope. And now I'm looking sideways at my arm right here. I'll take the stethoscope and put it right there, right at the base of my bicep. So that's where the stethoscope goes like that and I'm listening into the earpieces here, All right? This is where my ears are. You're also gonna take the blood pressure cuff and the cuff is gonna go around the arm here. The cuff is gonna go around the arm. And the cuff is the thing that has that little bulb next to it. And you're gonna squeeze the bulb, squeeze the bulb, squeeze the bulb. It's gonna take this cuff and it's gonna tighten the cuff around the arm. All right. And then, so this is the cuff and the arrow of the cuff, maybe make it like this. The arrow of that cuff is gonna be directly over the brachial artery, which is at the bottom again of the bicep. I'm gonna take the cuff, you're gonna squeeze the bell like this, squeeze this thing. It's going to tighten up the cuff over the bicep. So those are the kind of things that are working together. Let me get rid of your eyes and stuff so that I can continue with a clean screen. So these are the things that are working. You have your stethoscope, which is this thing here, the thing that looks like this that you have the diaphragm that you're gonna use, you're gonna put that on the brachial artery. You have your sphygmo manometer, which is the, the cuff with the Velcro on this side and the Velcro on that side and your arrow that goes over the brachial artery. And you have your little tube here that has the bell. And on the bell, there's like a little button here that if I turn it one way and I squeeze this little rubber thing, then the air fills this up. And if I screw the little dial the opposite way, then the air comes out. This is your stethoscope. And this is your sphygmomanometer. You're gonna take the stethoscope, make sure that you put it in so that your ear pieces are facing away from your head. You're gonna use the main diaphragm of the stethoscope to do your analysis. You're gonna take the sphygmomanometer and you're gonna put the arrow of the sphygmomanometer, which is right here, directly over the brachial artery, which is the artery that runs at the bottom of your bicep here. You're gonna take the diaphragm of the stethoscope and also place it over the brachial artery. Okay, so that's where we're at right now. Does anybody have any questions? Is anybody lost? Has anybody done this before? Does anybody need help where we're at right now? It's obviously difficult to do this on a computer, but thumbs up if everybody knows what I'm talking about. Thumbs up, Alice is good, couple people good. All right, Chris, good. All right, so let's keep going. Let's explain what's gonna happen. If you've ever done a blood pressure, you'll notice that at the beginning, all right, in the beginning, let's clear this, undo, clear, clear all drawings. In the beginning, you're not gonna hear, no sound. One, no sound. You're not gonna hear anything. 
you put the sphygmomanometer on, you put the cuff on, and you're not going to hear anything. Right now, the arm is like this. Here's your arm, here's your hand, your thumb, your fingers, your fingers, your finger, pinky finger. The arm is like this, and it's bent. And here's your upper arm, and here's your bicep here, and bicep down there. So this is your bicep muscle. All right, and right now you're gonna take the stethoscope, you're gonna put it in your ear, you're gonna take the cuff and you're gonna put it around your arm right here. And here's your brachial artery, right? It's gonna go all the way down here, right here. And the stethoscope is gonna be right over the brachial artery. Here's the, the bell of the stethoscope is gonna be right over the brachial artery. And this line is going to all the way down and this is going to go into your ears. And you're listening here. And you're facing your subject, eyes this way. And your ears are here and you're listening. All right, now I'm going to show you what the, the manometer says. Right now the manometer is going to say something like this. It's going to say zero. Over here is going to be 70. Over here is going to be 80. Over here is 90. And then 100. 110. And 120. And 130. And so forth. Might as well finish it. 140, 150, 160, 70, 180. All right, let's just be done and make this one 220. Our typical values for our diastolic blood pressure is equal to about, let's say normal is 80. And our systolic blood pressure is equal to 120. So at first, when there's no air and I don't pump anything into this cuff, there's no air in the cuff, none. I put the cuff on, but the cuff is loose and I'm listening. What am I gonna hear out of my ears? There's no air in the cuff. I did place the cuff around the brachial artery. I did put the stethoscope here. So everything is set up the right way. But right now, there is no air in the cuff. It's zero air. So there's zero pressure in the cuff. So I'm not going to hear any sound. And I'll explain what that means. Let's say I have a hose, a garden hose. And the garden hose has this little spigot that comes from the wall. Usually it looks like kind of like that kind of spigot. And then the spigot has a little faucet, which has the little grains on it. And then the hose attaches to that faucet. And here's the end of the hose. If this is turned all the way off, this is off. And this is on. And this is just a garden hose that comes out of your house. If the hose is all the way off, it means that there's no water flowing through the hose. If there's no water flowing through the hose, and I take this stethoscope, and I put the stethoscope on the garden hose right here, and I listen to the garden hose, I'm listening here to try to hear a noise. If I'm listening to the garden hose and there's no water going through the garden hose, I'm not going to hear anything. There's nothing happening in the garden hose. There's nothing, no water flowing. So I'm not going to hear anything at all. There's going to be no sound. If I turn the garden hose all the way on, all the way, turn the spigot all the way, 
And now water is rushing through the hose. Water is coming through the hose like this. And it pours out of the bottom of the hose like that. And I take the stethoscope and I listen then. I'm also not going to hear anything at all because all of this is going to sound just like this. Just there's nothing stopping the water from flowing. So it's all going to sound like white noise. And most likely if it's all the way off or all the way on, I'm not going to hear anything at all. Because if it's all the way off, no water can go through the hose. And if it's all the way on, then water is going through the hose continuously. So either I'm not going to hear any noise at all, or I'm only going to hear white noise, which in all intents and purposes is almost no noise at all. And when you're listening to blood pressure, you're actually not listening to the heart sound at all. You're not listening to the heartbeat when you do blood pressure, even though when you listen through the stethoscope, it's gonna go boof, 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 boof. And that beat is gonna be very correlated with the heartbeat, but when you're taking blood pressure, you're actually not listening to the heart itself at all. Now, if you take this stethoscope and you put it in front of somebody's heart, like your doctor does, then you will hear the heartbeat. But when you're taking blood pressure, you're not listening to the heartbeat. What you're listening to rather is the rush of blood underneath the stethoscope. So you could imagine if I turn the water on and then off and then on and then off and then on and then off, I would hear water rush and then stop, water rush and then stop, water rush and then stop. And it's the rush of water underneath the amplification device, device, which is your stethoscope, which will help you hear. But what you're hearing here is the rush of water underneath the stethoscope, not the actual heartbeat itself. So let's say you take this stethoscope cuff here and you take the cuff and you crimp it all the way. So you take this little bell here that's attached to the cuff and you blow all the air into it by squeezing this little cuff over and over and over. You squeeze this little rubber bell or this rubber um, squishy thing and air fills the cuff. And eventually what happens is you take this cuff and you tighten it is like say for instance, up to 180 beats per minute, 100, sorry, 180 millimeters of mercury. Well, a typical systolic blood pressure, which is when the heart is beating as hard as it can, it's forcing the blood out of the heart as hard as it can. And typically what it does is it pushes on the outside of the, the blood vessels with 120 units of pressure. Imagine though, if as the blood is pumping, I take this cuff and here's 120 right here, 120. If I take the cuff and I tighten the cuff past 120 millimeters of mercury and I pass this 120 beats per minute, then what's gonna happen is the cuff is going to be so tight around the arm, whoopsies, the cuff is going to be so tight around the arm that if the hose is pushing outwards with 120 units of pressure, but the cuff is pulling inwards with more than 120 units of pressure, then the cuff is going to stop the blood or the water flowing through the hose. So when I initially pump up the blood pressure cuff to pass whatever the systolic blood pressure is for my subject, you'll crimp the entire brachial artery and you'll stop the blood flow from going through. And if that's the case, 
when you pump the blood pressure cuff all the way past their systolic blood pressure to like say 180 or whatever, you won't hear anything because there's no blood flowing through the vein. All right, sweet. All right, so the next thing is, if I don't pop the cuff up at all, and say for instance, the cuff has no air in it at all, or if the cuff, if I pump the cuff up to like here, which is just under 70 millimeters of mercury. Well, during diastole, the heart is pushing the blood vessels outwards with 80 units of pressure. But here the cuff is only tightening up with less than 80 units of pressure. So anything under 80 units of pressure is like the garden hose is completely and totally on. If the blood vessel is pushing outwards with more pressure than the cuff is pushing inwards, there's nothing stopping the blood flowing through the vein. So in that case, in this range right here, you're not going to hear anything at all. But in that case, it's more because of the white noise situation. So in this range here, you're not gonna hear anything. Or to be more precise, if I pump the cuff up to millimeters of mercury or to units that are less than the subject's diastolic blood pressure, there's still nothing stopping the blood from flowing through the vein. So I won't hear anything. So there will be no noise here, no noise. And there will also be no noise here. And there's not going to be any noise all the way until the systolic blood pressure. So all the way in this range right here, from 120 beats to min per minute, from 120 millimeters of mercury all the way to the 180, I'm also not going to hear anything because here there's no blood going through the vein. Here, all of the blood is going through the vein. Here, none of the blood is going through the vein. I won't hear anything in the orange sections. But now between these sections here, I got a unique situation going on. All right, between 80 and 120. All right, now if the cuff is pumped to 180 millimeters of mercury, what you do is slowly you take this rubber ball thing and right next to it there's going to be a little dial that you can loosen and let the air out of this cuff so you pump the cuff up all the way you crimp the artery you're not going to feel or hear anything and you're going to loosen this little dial and slowly but surely what's going to happen is this dial is going to start to drop it's going to go all the way here slowly, very slowly, very slowly. You won't hear anything. 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 And then boom, you get to the point where the pressure of the heart on the veins pushing the blood out starts to exceed the pressure in the cuff. And right here, when the heart is beating, blood is going to squirt out underneath the stethoscope. But when the heart is relaxing, the cuff is still going to be strong enough to stop the blood from going through. So you won't hear anything. And then the heart's going to beat again, and it's going to overcome the pressure in the, it's going to overcome the pressure in the sphygmomanometer and then you'll hear a beat. But then during diastole, you won't. But then during systole, you will again. And then you will again. And then you will again. And then you will again. And what you're hearing in this range, the beats that you're hearing in this range, is not the actual beats of the heart. It's the change in pressure compared to the vessel, the brachial artery, and the sphygmomanometer. And when the blood is able to squirt through the sphygmomanometer, you'll hear something. And then when it's no longer able to, you won't hear anything. 
then you keep the dial going down, keep the dial going down. Eventually you're here. It's gonna sound like a beat. When you hear the first beat, that's the systolic blood pressure. You'll hear it. It sounds like a little bit of a squish. Go, and then it'll go, then it'll go boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. And then the whole while, this needle is still going down. You're still letting air out, still letting air out, still letting air out. And now you get to the point where the diastolic blood pressure, the pressure in the heart when the heart is relaxing, all right, is still going to be always higher than the pressure in the sphygmomanometer. And then you won't hear anything anymore because it's white noise. So you're going to pump all the way up past the systolic blood pressure. You won't hear anything. Reduce the air in the cuff by about two to three millimeters of mercury per second. And then wait. And eventually what's gonna happen is the pressure during systole is gonna overcome the pressure in the sphygmomanometer. And then what will happen is you'll start to hear the rush of blood, rush of blood, rush of blood, rush of blood. And when you cannot hear any more beats or when you cannot hear the sound of the blood rushing underneath the sphygmomanometer, that's when you're gonna take your diastolic blood pressure. So your systolic blood pressure is the first beat that you hear, the first beat. Now that's different in some books. Sometimes they say the first auditory sound. Sometimes they say the first clear speed, but we don't have accurate enough stethoscopes to determine. So for me, it's the first beat and the diastolic blood pressure is when there's absolutely no sound anymore. And typically the values for a healthy individual are gonna be about 120 millimeters of mercury is where you'll start hearing the first beat and about 70 to 80 millimeters of mercury is where you won't hear anything anymore. So in this range of a healthy individual is where you start hearing the beat. Now, there's a couple of different ways to estimate your systolic blood pressure because I don't want to necessarily, when I tighten up the cuff, I don't want to necessarily take the cuff and tighten the cuff all the way to 225 beats for everybody. Because if you have an elderly individual and you're taking this cuff and you're pumping all of the air into it, I don't know, if somebody's on prednisone, it could be difficult for their skin to handle. In any event, you don't want to necess you don't want to unnecessarily pump the cuff up for anybody. You want to have a way of estimating how high you would set the pressure in the step in the sphygmomanometer so that you don't have to overly add air into this um, into the cuff. You don't want it to be uncomfortable uncomfortable for people. So the way to measure it is what you're gonna do is without the stethoscope, this is how to estimate it. You don't need the stethoscope. You put the sphygmomanometer on and what you're gonna do is palpate the radial pulse again with your two fingers, normally like you would. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna pump the cuff up. You're gonna pump the cuff up to 70 beats per minute and see whether or not you can feel the pulse at their wrist. If you can feel the pulse, pump it up to 80. See if you can feel the pulse. If you can feel the pulse, still pump it up to 90. If you can still feel the pulse, pump it up to 100. If you can still feel the pulse, pump it up to 110. If you can still feel the pulse, pump it up to 120. But for the most people, for the most part, normal individuals have a systolic blood pressure about 120. So if I pump the cuff up now to 130, 
what will happen is I'll stop feeling the radial pulse. The cuff is tight enough to crimp the blood flow all the way down the arm and I won't feel the pulse anymore here. That is your estimate of systolic blood pressure. So if I stop feeling the pulse at 130, I let all the air out of the sphygmal manometer and I'm getting ready now to use, to use now my stethoscope. And there's no reason for me to take the bell or this, this pump here and pump it all the way to the end of the dial. There's no reason because it's just gonna cause unnecessary uh, discomfort. So you take the estimate, you take the value of the pressure in the cuff where you stopped feeling the radial pulse, use that as your estimate for the systolic blood pressure. And when you press the little bulb to get air into your sphygmomanometer, what you do is you pump it up from to 130, which is your estimate, 130 plus 40 extra millimeters, plus 40 extra millimeters of mercury. So for this individual, when I stop feeling the radial pulse at 130, I'm going to pump when I'm actually going to do the blood pressure, I'm going to pump only to 170 now. Now, 170 millimeters of mercury for this individual is still going to be high enough for the sphygmal manometer to be tight enough to not hear the blood. It's going to be high enough to overcome the systolic blood pressure, and the individual's not going to have blood flowing underneath the stethoscope. So there's not going to be any noise. And I've saved pumping unnecessary air and discomfort all the way to the end of the manometer. And then from the estimate, I can reduce two to three millimeters of mercury. I'll end up hearing at just about what the estimate is. So not only does the estimate make it so that I don't have to overcuff. And by overcuffing, I don't mean talking on the phone too long when you're not supposed to be. I mean just over sphygma manometering. And then when you reduce the air at about the estimate of their systolic blood pressure, you'll start hearing the beat, and then the beat, and then the beat, and then the beat, and then the beat. There's more air leaving, and eventually I don't hear anything anymore. And when I first hear the beat is going to be my systolic blood pressure. And when I don't hear anything anymore, it's going to be my diastolic blood pressure. And those are the values that you're going to mark on your systolic and bl uh, diastolic blood pressure. Again, you would take three measurements and take the average. Now, for your labs, you're not going to need to do blood pressure. But it's important for you to understand the best that I can on line like this, what blood pressure is and the nuances and what you're going to be doing. I think that's probably enough for right now. Does anybody have any questions about anything like that? Has anybody taken a blood pressure before? And does this stuff sound reasonable? Is this congruent with what you've done in the past? Anybody at all? I have. Right, and is this reasonable for you? Yeah, it is. All right, does there, is there anybody that has any questions at all? When you take a look at the heart rate lab, remember, you're not obligated to do the blood pressure. But what I would do is take a look at the blood pressure part of the lab write up, read what this says. I think it will make a lot of sense to you now that we've gone over it. If you can go to CVS and get your blood pressure in one of those automatic cuffs, great. I'd like you to fill out the heart rate and blood pressure section of the lab write up. And I'd like you to start to put together your first 
heart rate, blood pressure lab report and submit that ASAP into the, the lab portion, I believe, of your Brightspace. And then what I can do is go back and start making comments and editing. And you can try as many times as you want on all of these papers to get the best grade that you can. And everything is due the last day of the semester. So I think that I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>